Oh my God, that was like awesome. Awesome and don't you feel energized and you're gonna go out and do something. Chris, please come. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, good morning. Um, first off, congratulations, Lynn, great job. Uh, and to all of you, thank you. Um, I am very happy to be here. Chris, thank you for the good news. Uh, I can attest to that 50% tax in San Francisco. It's uh, criminal. Some thoughts on gentrification as we've been tasked to address issues of social equity in this uh, panel today. Um, gentrification also implies displacement in successful walkable urban neighborhoods and uh, urban cores. Strangely enough, the academic research on this issue is absolutely all over the map, and it's not conclusive at all, as you might suspect. I often pr provoke my real estate development classes with the fact that um, gentrification should be viewed as an opportunity and not a problem. The key challenge uh, is how to spread out the benefits of gent gentrification more equitably, uh, trying to replace a narrative of displacement with a new one of opportunity. Very often, two things occur in gentrifying neighborhoods uh, which are not commonly talked about. In fact, new income and economic opportunity helps to allow existing residents to stay in the neighborhood, particularly if they are property owners. And two, households are often more resilient than we give them credit. Current neighborhood residents do employ extraordinary coping mechanisms to stay. What the research does show is clear. As neighborhoods improve, locals fight harder to stay. Solid research in gaining neighborhoods through gentrification or walkable urban development indicates some startling findings. That existing property owners do gain economically, and very often those that choose to sell and leave the, the uh, neighborhood taking advantage of increased property values they often do so to go to other neighborhoods that they had previously desired. The real key and biggest problem um, in, in gentrifying neighborhoods is what we find as a new barrier to entry for uh, any new low income uh, residents who want to move into the neighborhood. And this seems like a problem which is solvable through several uh, tools that uh, Chris has just talked about, and I was going to go through some of the same tools, but I, I don't have to now. So what all might uh, this suggest from a policy point of view, uh, that city fathers can in good faith support the new urbanism and assent uh, through walkable neighborhood uh, urban development, providing long-term security of tenure for remaining low-income residents, but really focusing efforts on uh, as you put it, attainable housing. I like that. It sounds better than, uh, it has a different connotation than affordable housing provision to allow low-income uh, in-movers to neighborhoods that are gentrifying. But let's assume the worst and attempt to address the issue of displacement in gentrifying neighborhoods and the provision of needed uh, attainable housing uh, and discuss uh, what are some of these tools which may be employed to achieve social equity. Um, and again, we can dis discuss these in relation to uh, a, an overarching notion of value capture, again, something Chris mentioned. Uh, the tools that have been very, very effective, uh, particularly in the Bay Area where I'm recently coming from and have uh, been studying very closely, special assessment districts associated with provisions of streetcars and other interurban uh, transportation and infrastructures, again, associated with promoting TODs and walkable uh, development, walkable urban development, um, have been uh, important in uh, maintaining uh, some value capture in uh, gentrifying or up, up uh, atta attainable neighborhoods. Upzoning and assessing developer fees to establish affordable housing trust funds has also been another mechanism that we see uh, uh, has been employed successfully around the country. And, and as Chris mentioned, we were involved in doing something similar as developers in Albuquerque, New Mexico, about 10 years ago. Inclusionary zoning, of course, you mentioned transferable development rights, uh, another key uh, item that you did mention. Um, land trusts, and very, very uh, significantly, we, there, there's a lot of 
low-income housing tax credit money that is uh, employed in the wrong places. And Chris, you point out that if these funds are more strictly uh, targeted uh, to walkable urban developments, uh, it would go a long way in providing um, affordable, ho attainable housing, affordable housing that's getting developed anyway, oftentimes in the wrong places. Um, and I want to mention something that uh, I think is key, is that if handled early, and it's easy to, to see what neighborhoods are going to be coming around and gentrifying and are on the radar, or on the map, if addressed early, uh, sometimes it takes very little uh, just to uh, sort of stay in, stay in the game, so to speak. So we have to handle direct displacement by not uh, losing any units in the process of a revitalizing or gentrifying neighborhood. Indirect displacement due to higher rents is a little bit tougher to handle. However, regulations put in place designed uh, for early intervention to protect legacy property owners, and the conversation right now is really focused on renters, I think appropriately as well, um, can work in neighborhoods that are ident identified as increasingly uh, uh, or rapidly changing and transforming or gentrifying. And finally, uh, catalytic and mission-driven uh, developers uh, exist in this country and have done some great, great uh, work and are, you know, generally our heroes, I think, uh, here at the CNU. Um, and that oftentimes, voluntarily, they do the right thing through community benefits agreements or, once again, through their sort of mission focus, uh, get out in front of gentrification and intentionally work to develop in walkable urban neighborhoods. Um, now, Chris, I'm going to direct something to you. I had a number of topics. I don't think we're going to have time to, to cover them, but I think production is a key issue to address um, and very fruitful to discuss uh, today, Chris. What developers, investors, and builders who are currently involved in producing walkable urban neighborhoods, uh, I, wanna, I want you to talk a little bit about who they are, um, but also borne by market forces you've just identified, even the big production builders are, are getting it. Uh, now with folks like Lennar, KB, and Toll Brothers uh, developing large urban arms within their companies. Uh, of course, Lord knows everybody in this room is going to be needed to help these folks with design, um, and I know that they're calling on many of you. Uh, but Chris, could they be part of the uh, attainability or affordable solution? Um, and here associated with the production builders, as you've mentioned, uh, land scarcity isn't really the case. It's really land cost in core uh, land locations for infill and extraordinary, extraordinary barriers to entry uh, that the entitlement process uh, is, is, is attacking the cost of infill development. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about productions, the producers, the investors and developers that are doing it right mm -hmm. and um, maybe have the capacity uh, to see, to affect a sea change in walkable urban development? What we're seeing is that there are that, that there's a spectrum, as I showed you with those largest 30 uh, metros, that Boston's, the New York's, the DC's, um, the Seattle's, Portland's, Denver's, uh, San Francisco, uh, and in uh, Chicago, that, that, that the development community, generally speaking today, understands this. In DC, if you are not building a walkable urban high density uh, project, you're out of business. There's just no market for you. 90% of what's being built is now walkable urban. It wasn't that way 20 years ago. The ones that got into it earliest were the commercial uh, developers. So locust members like you know, yeah. Federal and JBG and Forest City, these folks got in and as, as they'll tell you, they have stripes on their back to show it, that they understood how to build you know, their rental apartments, their condo, or their, their rental apartments, their retail, their, their uh, various office projects in a high density mixed use fashion. It's the home builders that we have to next focus on. They're the laggards. And, and, and in real estate, I've been in the business 30 years and you know, the, um, all the commercial folks are much more sophisticated. The home builders are just kind of all shucks kind of guys and, and they tend to be guys, mm. um, you know, these, you know, these old white guys. And um, Emphasis on old. <laughs> And, um, but as you say, every major national home builder now has an urban division. And we've just had an interesting experience. Um, as, as you know, my uh, development partner is uh, Robert Davis. And, and he and I and our other 
partner, uh, Jason Duckworth, we're, we're doing a project in a walkable urban suburban location outside of Philadelphia. And we're coming in doing the, we're doing the horizontal work. And we have Toll Brothers, you know, the, the inventor of the McMansion as the vertical. And we initially were dealing with their suburban folks. They didn't have a clue. What do you mean alleys? What do you mean curb cuts that are, you know, mm. six foot curb, or, uh, you know, six foot turning radiuses? At the, there at the corners. They just didn't have a clue. We then said goodbye, and we started working with their urban folks, and they get it. But the urban folks are like 10% of the total company. And again, the big thing is with home yeah, building, we'll like up in uh, Boston, we should be building 30, 40,000 units. Think of what that would do to the GDP up in Boston. And we're building five because the home builders don't get it. Yeah, yeah Chris. These are some thoughts I had coming into this, this uh, panel. Um, the jobs housing balance is something that we should talk about because that is such a critical uh, component in any sustainable planning uh, 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 aspect. And it, it has such uh, strong implications with uh, walkable urban neighborhoods uh, being created in our cities and importantly in our metropolitan regions is what I'm thinking about. Over the past 50 years, there has been um, significant job sprawl with migration mm -hmm. to the sub suburbs as well as uh, current job creation in the in the in the core right now of course is leading the leading the fight which is great but but what we do see is that jobs are centering in clusters um, both in the city and in our suburban edge cities as you've as you've mentioned um, this seems like to me it's a regional problem best addressed through uh, metropolitan level guidance of transportation infrastructures and uh, of course investment, as well as uh, where we need to land the majority of our housing production. Uh, what I'm suggesting and wondering is if this discussion of the creation of walkable urban communities uh, might be contemplated not only as infill in our cities and our urban cores, but also as something which might be employed in our suburbs where edge cities uh, cluster jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to help our auto dependent exurbs Absolutely. identify. So right. through walkable urban development, um, it's not anathema out there too, is it? Not at all. Um, and, and I hope I didn't imply that, that, that and particularly in, in Metro DC, which our numbers are showing is, is, is leading the way here in this country, that 50% of the walkable urbanism is in the center city. 50% are the urbanizing suburbs. So if you want to understand the urbanization of the suburbs, you must understand Arlington, Virginia, which has eight walk-ups in the smallest county in the country, physically. And it's just, a, you know, we've learned so much from Arlington. It's the reason I moved back mm -hmm. to DC was because there's so many lessons to, to be learned. And so, and, and again, we're doing this study of the, of the corporate headquarters relocations and you know the preliminary findings are that they're coming into the walkable urban places, whether they be suburban, like Marriott is probably going to stay in, uh, I'm going to guess Montgomery County, but in a walkable urban place rather than a business park. The interesting thing is, is that the edge cities are beginning to crater. And I wrote an article in the Atlantic six years ago now that was entitled The Next Slum. And it's the drivable suburban fringe. We've overbuilt it. We built too much of the wrong product in the wrong location. And it's gonna be a major social drag on this, on this uh, society. And so up in Boston, just yeah, please. one more uh, example. 128 was where the big high tech firms were back in the 80s. Today, all the high tech firms, the software firms are downtown or in Cambridge or Somerville. And the, the few firms that are still stuck out on 128 they have to pay a $25,000 per year salary bonus mm. to attract the software guys and girls out there. That comes right out of the real estate. We're now seeing, we're seeing some discussions over the last six, nine months that business parks may become bulldozer bait. Yeah. It's bulldozer the same conundrum bait. that uh, Silicon Valley is now facing where yeah. You know, San Francisco turned into a reverse commute exactly. for the uh, employees of the, the tech industry. Right. So, so both of you talked a lot about, well, the opportunity. I think it's so mind-blowing that we now have all this evidence and it's, it is. it's didn't exist 
just even a few years ago. Um, and the challenge of the imbalance of supply and demand, supply of walk-ups and, and, and the demand for it is so out of whack. But you both talked about tools that are necessary to manage the change. We talked about the attainable housing tools. It also strikes me there's the kind of walkability network, the biking, walking, no car question. share infrastructure that's necessary, particularly in the suburban mm -hmm. retrofit places. And that's often where the public sector plays a role. And here's what I want to kind of get you to think about. Um, how can we get the public sector leaders to geographically target their tools? Because so often what I see is that, you know, it's just peanut butter or it's a political deal. I'm doing some work in Los Angeles and you know, for whatever reason, every single council member has to have one of yep. the projects. So that's not connected with this idea of creating walk-ups and, you know, a, a critical yeah. mass of places. How do we do this? Well, the, the, um, it goes back to doing your homework and doing the fiscal impact work mm -hmm. to prove to the city councilors, to prove to the governors that mm -hmm. if you invest here, you're not going to get much return at all. You invest here, you get mm -hmm. four, 12 mm -hmm. times more. Mm -hmm. And so downtown DC, which had 70, no, they had 90 surface parking lots 20 years ago. Today they have one that's yeah. just about to go under the shovel mm -hmm. for a new hotel. Um, downtown DC now generates a net contribution to the government of a billion dollars per year. That pays for the entire school budget. Yeah. So you don't think that the place manager, the guy who's the head of the downtown bid, mm -hmm. when he calls the mayor, the mayor's <laughs> gonna pick up the phone. And yeah. he says, I need more, trans." I mean, the big discussion is how to get more capacity into Metro. Yeah. And so it tends to get your attention, follow the money. Yeah. Chris, are you learning anything about this well, in your work? Well, well, I am. I mean, I, I, wanna, be, I wanna be fair to municipalities and, and regional authorities and, and transportation Why? planners <laughs> <laughs> uh, presently who yeah. I think get the theory now. I do think yeah. they understand Some and I do think that they're putting together plans that recognize, I mean, a good example is, and, and it goes back to this metropolitan scale, um, something called the 2040 Plan B area, which is to accommodate mm -hmm. two uh, million new uh, residents and one million new jobs in the B area uh, over the next 30 years are targeted on 5% of the land and, and are transportation um, uh, infrastructure focused and uh, incidentally uh, environmentally uh, environmental regulations are being sort of relaxed to 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 help this this development in mm -hmm. infill um, and to promote TODs and walkable urban development so um, let's hope that you know the, the, I think they have it in mind now um, Who's holding it up? Is it still the NIMBYs? Is it still? NIMBYs are You know, it's, it's not the developers anymore. No. Again, in, in uh -huh. the, okay. I, I think the thing we're talking about is, we're talking about a strong markets, Chris. In the strong yes. markets, right. we're That's already true. there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, the developers get it. I think the municipalities, the city fathers get it. If they're having trouble landing things on the ground, it's a function of just getting the machinery and the, and, and the, the staff on mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. um, it's the weak markets that we gotta worry about. That's and that great. was a second That's charge great. in our social equity uh, inquiry on this panel today is, is how do you get the weak markets and how do you get the segregated mm -hmm. and economically uh, depressed neighborhoods in our, in our inner city cores um, to benefit from walkable urban development? Yeah, so, so this is something that um, I was reflecting on as I was listening to both of you in those you know places that aren't super hot can we latch on to the entrepreneurial spirit the create a culture of small builders mm -hmm. um, do more of the um, 
small startups. Mm, yep. Is that how does that fit in, and and is there a culture of small building starting to mm -hmm. happen, or is it still, you know, we're with the big production builders, and that's mm. all there is. No, I, I, there's no question that this is happening. I think of Kansas City. I do a lot mm -hmm. of work in Kansas mm -hmm. City. And um, they have, uh, you know, downtown's coming back. Downtown adjacent places are coming back. They have, and they've always had the uh, country club district, which is a fabulous walkable mm -hmm. urban place that yeah. they adore. Mm -hmm. And they're now linking it, it's under construction, with a streetcar, mm -hmm. their first streetcar in 50 years. And it was a, you know, it was a brutal battle. And I have no doubt that once that streetcar opens, in fact, before it's opening, it's already happening. Small developers, some some of which are my friends, they're sticking the necks out, and you know we all want to have another Portland take place. Fifty-five million dollar streetcar, three point five billion dollars worth of private sector investment. And the other story about Portland, by the way, in the Pearl District, thirty percent of the housing that was delivered, all brand new housing, was attainable, highest percentage of, I have ever seen for new housing. We have just a few more minutes. I'm going to ask one more question, but if folks have, want to come up to the mics, if you have a question, I think we could probably fit in a Shall few. I, just, I, want to, I want to say one thing on, 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 the, pa on the previous question. Um, you've, I, I think about New Orleans and Detroit as maybe mm -hmm. representative of mm -hmm. the, the question you ask. Can these yeah. weaker markets uh, come back? Uh, I, I have a lot of experience in New Orleans recently and um, can say, you know, New Orleans has urbanism in its DNA, in its blood, and you've got an entrepreneurial spirit and a, and a city fabric that, uh, and, and a resiliency, it's coming back, and it's coming back in precisely the way you're yeah. talking about with, with really, really local and small scale yeah. entrepreneurs. Detroit, you know, Detroit is the great experiment, and we're, you know, you, you can't li afford to live in Brooklyn anymore, and no joke, that's, that, those entrepreneurs are moving to Detroit, and I think, great you story. know, we gotta wait about five years and see what happens in, in Detroit. The foundation money that's propped it up and its development uh, initiatives ha has, has sort of cycled through. But there is an enthusiasm there and people are homesteading. Yeah. And, and we are doing let's a see lot. if the American you know, spirit, mm -hmm. if not urbanist spirit, doesn't take hold there. We'll see. No, uh, you, you may have heard that uh, Maurice Cox has just become the uh, new city planner in the city of uh, Detroit. Maurice is one of the great planners out there. And I, when he was asking me whether he should take it, I said, Maurice, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Once there in is a lifetime. so much already in the pipeline yeah. that you know, two years ago, Time Magazine had a Detroit on the cover as the yeah. poster child of this function. I said, Detroit, um, I said that Maurice, two years from now, it's gonna have Detroit on the cover of being the, you know, the comeback kid and you'll be on the cover. There we go. Yeah. It's already, it's already taken off. I'll just have one little piece of commentary and then um, we'll turn to the questions. But I think that one issue that we need to face, particularly in the hot market cities where the anxiety about gentrification and displacement is on fire, mm -hmm. is yes, it's about affordability, but it's also about possibility of losing their culture, losing the history, losing yes. the feeling of places, losing the stores that they've shopped at and the institutions. That's the and, and, and we do concern. have to start talking about that because I think it's, it's uh, part yeah. of the reality that There's people a, are facing. There is an offset to that though, which is our cities have always Changed. changed i agree and nobody owns any section of the city yeah. it was a portuguese section of town then it was italian then it was mm -hmm. black then it was jewish then it was yeah. you know yuppie and you know you can't you can't, can't stop freeze it, it yeah and okay let's go to the questions then we'll see if we have enough time to keep going on this please i'd like to um ask for your reactions to a couple of uh, thoughts one is, um, I took a uh, tour to Plano yesterday. One of the things that was really instructive was finding out how much the city was doing, acting almost as a, as a master developer. And it seems like that might be one piece that's kind of missing here, mm -hmm. is 
not, you know, maybe we shouldn't try to figure out a way for master developers, big developers, to make it in the city, uh, but help find city, help cities find ways to unlock their value that's been undervalued for so long. That's a um, so they could be the master developers and sell off entitled lots, basically. Oh, thank you. The second thought is, mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like your reaction to that, but the second thought is, um, it sounds like there's a lot of thinking here about um, figuring out a more efficient way to extract rents, which is fine, but that can really be exploitative. So the question is, how can you, how can we help people, the, you know, the peons, uh, how can we help people who live in these places to get some of the equity, literally some of the equity through co-ops, mm -hmm. condominiums, that sort of thing, so that the people who live there, I mean, one thing about the suburbs is people were able to build some equity. How can we do that when urban places are so vibrant? It seems a real shame that everybody should move into the city and then a few people get rich. Do you want to answer? Or I'm just keeping us moving because we're just well, about out of time. A, a quick response is that um, I, I really appreciate the empowering the city as master developer. There are many uh, examples of that being a really successful model. Um, one in particular is one, one that Chris and I were involved with for 10 years of, of transforming downtown Albuquerque in probably one of the quickest downtown revitalizations. With the city acting as the master developer and sort of touching the lots and, and putting back into play uh, the, the areas it want to redevelop in its downtown core and then enlisting local developers, really successful. It's a, it's a great strategy and, and in principle you love the idea that the city and city fathers and locals are in charge of how their city gets uh, redeveloped or revitalized. It works, but it's political and it takes really, um, it, it's sort of when the, the serendipity and good fortune of, of, of in, in enlightened political leadership like a Jerry Brown did by getting, you know, 10,000 units of housing built in downtown Oakland over the past 15 years. Um, it works when you have uh, uh, it, it inspired leadership. It's sort of personality-based and place-based, and it can and work great. And to a certain extent, in downtown Albuquerque, it came to a halt when the the, mayor the you know the good mayor left, the not so good mayor came yeah. in, and he was in the pockets of the uh, suburban sprawl developers. Yeah. And they hated to see what was going on down here, uh, uh, down there, and just you know, put roadblocks in. So, I find either nonprofit catalytic <coughs> developers or they can be for profit, tend to be a better uh, solution. And um, and those nonprofit catalytic developers, like what I mentioned out out at, out at UC Irvine, their mission was to build affordable, attainable housing. Second question, as far as building equity. A, with the affordable housing um, uh, strategy, that it sh you shouldn't allow the housing, I don't think, to mark to market, you know, a deeply discounted house, if it's a for sale house, mark to market, that it should always be 55% of market, but you can still, as the market increases, hopefully, you'll still be at 55%, so you can build net worth. The other solution, or the other opportunity is what I mentioned with I mentioned with the fundrise, that we now have it's legal hmm. to invest. You know, normally you would have to be a bank or be a accredited right. investor yeah. with a with a million hmm. dollars of of discretionary capital to be right. an accredited investor. Now we can invest a thousand dollars in your local coffee shop, and they've got a table waiting yeah. for you. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Okay, uh, I know that a lot of the CNUs that I've been to, that there's a lot of focus on detail to get things right. Mm -hmm. So this is for Chris Leinberger. How important is it to get the right pair of socks? 